Okay, so, ladies and gentlemen, not that long ago, the human understanding of the world was filled with myths and superstition. Causes of various events were being explained about by mythical forces and phantoms of imagination. Various misfortunes and, uh, well, troubles of common people were being blamed upon witches which would burn in the middle of the town. Oh, what a view, right? And those strange repetitive sounds in the middle of the night that at the time when everybody is supposed to sleep, somewhere upstairs, seemingly in your parents' bedroom, well, that's a boogeyman. But, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for the scientific method, we have been able to sort these beliefs out. We have been given the framework to look at the world in a different way. First of all, by making the hypothesis, and then, second of all, uh, by checking that hypothesis uh, uh, in response to the empirical world, which means that if somebody says to you that it is a boogeyman, you should better go and check it. And trust me, a lot has been revealed by the application of this method. Now, then 2008 happened the Great Recession, so-called the Great Moral Crisis of Economics. And there is a bit of a myth that nobody saw it coming. Actually, there were quite many economists, investors, who did saw it coming. And uh, I have read a little story about them, and I got kind of inspired. I, I began to think, why did these guys actually saw it coming and other, other, others didn't? And in fact, those guys, not only did they see it coming, they also reaped a great profit from it. So I decided I should take up a subject studied at the time by so many young and beautiful people called economics. Now, I also knew that uh, there might be some pitfalls because there were so many economists who didn't see the crisis coming. So I needed a theoretical framework. What does it mean? Well, basically a very simple thing. Well, I needed First of all, that my theoretical framework would be logical so, I, so that my mind would be able to comprehend. And then second of all, it had to correspond to reality around me. And third, it had to be practically applicable. Because there are so many economic theories that explain everything so well, and yet they are hard to apply in the reality. They can explain the thing when it happens, but they can't foresee it coming. And so, this is how my journey began. Uh, immediately, I have seen several interesting thing, things. Um, I don't want to spoil it, but I have to say that sometimes when I would look at the arguments of the economists, I would feel a strange medieval aura around it, and sometimes I would feel like an anthropologist or as, uh, as a philosopher, because some of those arguments, well, didn't really, uh, didn't really remind me of scientific method and the truth of the scientific method. Now, one of the very common arguments that I have found, I actually found it so many times that I even given a name for it, the argument which I called Describe the status quo and then hope. Most of the economists in 2006 and 2008, uh, 2007 would say, well, the economy is doing just fine, therefore nothing is going to happen. Basically, you would see the economist, he is all dressed up in a suit, and uh, of course he has a serious name of exaggerated uh, contemplation. And when asked about the growth, he would say, well, the growth is good, the uh, exports are good, the industrial production is doing great, therefore tomorrow is going to be just freaking dandy. And if you didn't see the problem in the argument, I will give you the analogy. Imagine a weatherman would come on his show and would say, well, today we have a lot of sun, we have a lot of uh, good weather, a lot of temperature, therefore tomorrow is going to be splendid. 
well, we would of course uh, be kind of interested to know the reasons behind it. <coughs> and in terms of economics, <coughs> sometimes it would seem rather interesting why there weren't too many reasons behind it. And I went to look for those reasons. I wanted to know why is growth such a thing which is taken for granted? Why is nominal demand taken for granted? Because in order to have growth, you have to have the nominal demand. And where do you get it from? Why does it increase so, so much? And uh, why does it increase and why the economy grows? That didn't seem to me like a very obvious question, uh, answer to the question. And so, <laughs> Can the mainstream help me out in my agony? Well, it kind of can. It has the answer. And the answer is, well, the animal spirits. Animal spirits are responsible for the man, to some extent. Well, if you're looking at this phrase, animal spirits, um, it kind of sounds kind of explosive in all of its scientific rigor behind it. And you don't really understand why should moods matter so much, because, <clears throat> just think about it. <clears throat> if it's all about the moods, then it means every eight years we have just a little tantrum, and every 50 years we have a big bad mood. So in that case, maybe instead of zero interest rates and quantitative easing, we should double down on therapeutic hypnosis and start in broadcasting the self-help section during the inter uh, uh, broadcasting self-help section. Uh, so that would improve uh, human, uh, so we would treat the anxiety and boost the animal spirits. Now the next argument, which comes um, even more troubling, it is accepted so widely and it is known as inflation expectations, which says that in order for us to have growth, there has to be some uh, inflation. And in, because of there is inflation, we are going to have a lot of demand. Because when people will see that prices are going up, they will rush to the shops and buy. Well, the problem with this argument is uh, Bank of International Settlements and Claudia Borro has done a research and found absolutely no evidence that could support this claim that uh, there is some sort of correlation between prices and economic activity. In that case, all of these self-respecting sciences would have refuted the claim and would have tried to find something else to substitute it. Well, not economics. In economics, it still remains to be seen as one of the most important explanations and rationales behind the monetary policy and inflation targeting today. Now, you might ask yourselves, why am I so perplexed with all of this, all of this thought about the nominal growth? Well, you see, <clears throat> if, you if, if you really think about it, why is the, wh where does the nominal growth come from? Where does the growth come, from, come, come from? Why do people spend? Well, we spend when we, don't, when we have money, and we don't spend when we don't have money. So, in order for us to spend, we have to have money. So the question is, where does the money come from? And that is a good question. Now, ladies and gentlemen, raise your hands, all of those who think that it's the government that creates money. Now, ladies and gentlemen, they raise your hands, all of those who think that it's the central bank who creates the money. Is there anybody who thinks who the central bank creates the money? No? Government? No? So who does create the money? Well, uh, the, the money is created by the banks. 97% of all of the money in the circulation is created by the banks. Now, this is interesting, because suddenly we realize where does the nominal co growth come from? We realize that money supply is not really fixed. Banks create money by extending credit. Here I give you the quote. 
by the Bank of England, which is the central bank of uh, United Kingdom. In modern economy, most of money takes form as a bank deposit. But how these bank deposits are created is often misunderstood. The principal way through which commercial banks make loans, whenever bank make, the principal way through which the bank makes a loan, the principal way of deposit creation is by banks making the loans. Whenever the bank makes a loan, it simultaneously creates the deposit and borrower's account, therefore creating new money. Which means that whenever bank creates a loan, it creates new money. Therefore, it creates new demand. Now, this is very interesting, because if you would take a look at uh, what is being taught at the university, you would realize that uh, banks are being described essentially as intermediaries. They take the deposits from people and they lend it out to the people. Well, that is absolute fiction. This is myth by the very definition of the word myth. Uh, because in reality, if you take the whole history of capitalism, there has never been a bank who simply would take people and lend it out. Banks create money and create purchasing power. Now that is very important. Why am I so... Uh, now that is very important. If you take a look... Um, this is very important because uh, if you take a look uh, at what creates and where does the growth come from, you essentially realize that it's pretty much a monetary phenomena. And that, ladies and gentlemen, means that it's time to say hello to the boogeyman. The economics, to a large degree, is a myth. It is a bunch of stories of not completely logical sequences, incomplete sequences, repeated by the economist in all of its scientific inanition and uh, intellectual uh, vocacity. Uh, and so... <coughs> okay. Uh, now, why am I so perplexed about this growth thing? Once you realize that nominal growth and essentially the all nominal growth comes from money creation, you also realize the thing that uh, this nominal growth engine through history tends to break down. And once it does break down, it leaves us all choking on our debts. Now, it's not an inevitability of the system. However, if the credit is uh, extended uh, poorly, then that might happen. And if you take a look through the whole history, 1837, 1873, 1929, those times, the depressions would happen. Now, why am I saying this? In the, 1980, in the 1980s, the whole developed world has underwent the deregulation, uh, deregulation, deregulated their financial systems, which means that the credit was let loose. Now, what followed was absolute explosion in credit. And it was, since it was poorly allocated, most of the credit not only created growth, but it also over-indebted the economy. If you take a look at the whole history from 1980s, in 1980s we had the recession. Government dropped the interest rate, people rushed to get their money, they borrowed, they spent, there was a lot of demand. However, 90s came about, and in the 90s we once again had a recession. Now, during this recession, uh, the government once again dropped the interest rate. New money popped into existence, new demand, happiness all around. Then 2000 came, the same happened. 2008 happened, and once again, we dropped the interest rate, and now it was on zero. Now, the problem is, the problem is, today, the interest rates are at zero. Money is, is as cheap as it can possibly get. However, nobody is borrowing it, which means that the engine of nominal demand is finally breaking down. And it might be the case that in the near future, we might be starting to choke 
on our debts because there are quite plenty of them. Um, so, uh, if you take a look, nobody is borrowing the money, and central banks are finally in their climactic battle, trying to squeeze the last bits of demand from this credit cycle. Now, the problem is, they are coming up with all of these new and even more desperate policies. However, the problem is, it is leading nowhere, and hopes are fading away, growth is fading away, and the nominal demand is actually fading away. Which means, ladies and gentlemen, let me say uh, to you and let me say to the world that there is, there are the makings for the depression. Now, the difference between the episodes in the history and now are so that Back in the old day, we had the gold standard, so uh, we didn't have much flexibility on the monetary side, which means today we don't have it and we kind of can't print money, which is good. However, the problem is the debts today are pretty much twice as high as they were in 1929, which is a big problem. So now, to conclude, I would like to say that um, for the half of my talk, pretty much, I have been criticizing the economics. Now, it doesn't mean that, there is, that all of the economics is bad. It means there is, there's quite a lot of good economics. However, most of it is behind the... Uh, behind the uh, well, it's not classified as the mainstream economics. And what I would like to say is, uh, even though today uh, there is nothing new under the sun, and so even though today, as back in the old days, there might be some people who dressed up in the suits, looking very smart, however, they may lay some, uh, they may lay the intellectual void beneath it, equivalent to the belief in the boogeyman, just as we have regarding the nominal growth today. And so the message is very simple. Think for yourselves. Think for yourselves. Thank you. Okay. Oh, you sound a bit like Nostradamus, I think. <laughs> so, when's the next crisis? Um, it is, well, Tomorrow the, or the, <laughs> the timing is always very difficult to predict, and uh, however, we can see the weakness already, and uh, uh, well, we will see what the governments do, uh, what they are doing, the if they tighten or if they loosen, and so, uh, well, we, are, we might be on the edge, actually, at the moment. As every good economist says, it depends. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.